David Olatunji Abioye was born March 11, 1960 and is from Kwara State. He is married to Pastor Mrs. Mary Abioye and together they have three children, a graduate of mechanical engineering and a renowned keynote speaker in both religious and secular conferences around the world. He wanted to start a technological firm to solidify his finances. However, when he met future founder of Living Faith Church Worldwide, David Oyedeko at a Christian Student Fellowship in the 1980s, he was inspired by what he saw as his passion and love for God. Over the years, their relationship transcends from brotherly friendship to a spiritual mentor. Bishop David Abioye is the executive and first vice president of the Living Faith Church Worldwide, aka Winners Chapel International. Abioye has published over 10 Christian, inspirational, and motivational books and other resources. Ladies and gentlemen, with a rising ovation, please stand up to welcome Bishop David Abioye. Praise the Lord. Somebody excited, praise the Lord. Well, show your excitement more than you are doing right now. A big shout, a big clap. Glory to God forevermore. Amen. Well, I realize that um, pastors tell people to do a lot of things that they fail to do. They speak as commanders, not as practitioners. When we say praise the Lord, you expect members to jump while pastors cross their legs. So now, um, when you are before the Lord, you behave as his child, not as his minister, not as his younger brother, not as his deputy. Children of God, let's give glory to God right now. Come on, shout. Some of you can still jump. Some can clap. Glory to God forevermore. In Jesus' precious name. If you can, please lift up your hands and let's worship the Lord some more. Give him thanks for bringing you and I into this Ministers and Leaders Forum of the year 2020. If you can, raise your voice. Make it loud. You are before your God. Express yourself. Open up to him. Let him reach out to you this morning. Let him reach out to you this morning. Worship him to prepare the atmosphere. Worship him to prepare your heart. Create joy environment around you right now. For with joy you shall draw waters out of the wells of salvation. With joy. With joy with joy. Yes, somebody rejoice in him. Bless his name. Let him see your smile. Give God the glory. Let him hear your spiritual voice. Giving him the glory. Worship him. Give him the thanks that is due to him. Give him the glory that is due to him. Thank you and thank you. Blessed be the Lord forever. In Jesus' wonderful name, we are prayed. In the name of Jesus. Thank you and thank you, our great King. We love you. We bless you. We give you the glory and the privilege to be listed among those to serve you. Receive our thanks in Jesus' precious name we have given thanks and let all the saints of God in the house say loud amen. amen Heavenly Father we want to thank you again this morning for this great forum of pastors of leaders and ministers and thank you for your servant that you've used to convene this meeting Pastor Davis Yemi we thank you for your good and upon him and now you've been using him and his wife and the great leaders of this forum. 
receive our thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, teach us and touch us. Heavenly Father, enlighten us and empower us. Heavenly Father, educate us and advance us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. To you be glory forever in Jesus' wonderful name. And all of us, saints in the house, say another loud amen. amen. One more time, if you can, give God a big hand and take your seat. Please take your seat. It is my great privilege this morning to be in this forum of ministers and leaders across the globe, all who are here live and those who are watching us virtual. I'd like to give thanks to God for the privilege and um, for the kind consideration of Pastor Yemi Davis to have invited me to be here to speak to all of us. I do believe that this morning, God will impart your life with something unique. I'm not hearing your amen. amen. Amen means let it be so. If it will be so for you, say another loud amen. amen. The theme of this conference, I understand, is building leaders that build the church. God is the builder of all things. We understand from scriptures. He that builded all things is God. But every house is builded by someone. God does not go on a mission until he finds and prepares the missioner. No work is ever done without a worker. Now, if you watch the ministry of Jesus, next to the work of redemption is the building of men. The building of men. He spent most of his time, apart from his evangelistic meeting, with his disciples. Mark 3, 4. He appointed the twelve that they might be with him and that he may send them. So before he sent them, he brought them to himself. He built them so they could go to build the future, the church. So building leaders in any ministry is very, very crucial. As a matter of fact, the future and the sustainer of any ministry is the building of men. The men build. They are the extensions, the carriers of the virtue and the values of the ministry. The topic I want to focus on is caption, developing leadership aptitude and attitude. Aptitude and attitude. The personal growth of any leader practically sets limit to the growth of the church. Until a man is developed, the church he pastors or the ministry he leads cannot advance. The minister or the pastor is called the leader. Now, in a way, the word leader is taken from a lead. L-I-D, it relates with lead. A lead means a cover 
a seal that you cannot go beyond. So no congregation or no ministry goes beyond the lead. The leader is the lead. I always encourage ministers to beware who you associate with. Because the association you keep will limit your growth and your spread. No one ever grows beyond the association he keeps. The company you keep determines the accomplishment you will make. There is something in the atmosphere of relationship that compels you to move forward, that compels you to grow forward. Therefore, beware who you choose as your leader. There is no prayer you can pray that will make you grow beyond the one who is taking the lead. In the West, part of Nigeria, they say that the fish spoils from the head. When people, especially wonderful women, you want to buy fish, you first check the head. If the head is rotten, don't taste the fish. You are taking poison. Everything begins from the head. And the head is the lead. Let me first of all, or furthermore, say something about the church, which I think it will help a lot of us pastors. You see, the peak of church growth is healthiness, not size. Many of us pray that church will grow numerically, but we are doing nothing for the church to grow healthily. Now, in the physical, you see quite some people with big body, but inside, big diseases. Growing healthily is the ultimate growth of any church. Healthy church growth. A church where you can move in and you can feel the heart of every believer connected, united. The healthiness of the church. But it begins with the pastor. Because according to Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, verse 9 rather, Hosea chapter 4 verse 9, as the priest, so is the people. Every church is a reflection of their pastor. Every church is a reflection, largely a reflection of their pastor. If the pastor is weak, the church will be weak. If the pastor is defiled, a large number of members of the congregation will be defiled. If the pastor is spiritual, the church largely will be spiritual. If the pastor is zealous, largely the church will be zealous. So, the leader, the pastor, the minister over any ministry determines the pace of the ministry. That's why Jesus literally reproduced himself in the 12th. They drank into him. They represented him fully. To the extent that nobody could stop them, like they couldn't stop Christ. They thought they killed him. They didn't know he has duplicated himself in 12 more troublesome people. And that's why the first thing the scripture recommends, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul told Timothy very clearly, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. And then secondly, take heed to your ministry. Colossians chapter 4 verse 17. And then Acts 20, 28. Take heed to the flock. Now, there are people who love ministry more than their personal spiritual life. I've met a lot of people like that. Who we prefer to be in ministry and go to hell 
than to preserve their personal life and secure their destiny. Otherwise, how do you explain this? Somebody is found doing wrong and he says, please do anything you can. Just let me remain in ministry. We grow inside out. We grow from root to fruit. That's why I say, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. My personal relationship with God is more critical to me than anything else. I would rather pastor a church of 30 people in my village than pastor a church of 30,000 people in the city. My personal spiritual life. What are we saying in this sense? Developing your walk with God is more valuable than concentrating on your work among men. What gives value to your work in ministry is your work with God. What gives value to your work in ministry is your walk with God. Your walk with God. You cannot truly walk with God and not make impact in your work among men in ministry. Those who present themselves to God are those who can represent God before men. Who you are before God is what you duplicate before men. You can't miss this. The leader must keep building, or if you allow me to use the word, developing himself on a continuous basis in order to see the effect on the ministry or the church or the people that he is leading. Let me quickly also note here that there is no prayer you can pray for God to use you more than your preparation. And preparation goes beyond prayer. You have to develop yourself. God assigns us according to our several abilities. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 15, a man called his three servants, and he gave them talents according to their several abilities, their several capacity and capability that they developed. It is according to your development because God will not put a weight on you that is beyond your size. Now there are people who are praying, oh Lord, give me church of 5,000 people. What's your preparation for it? What's your preparation? He will give you not just what you prayed for, but what you are prepared for. Otherwise the weight may kill you. So while you are praying for things to happen, start preparing for the things that God wants to make happen. This is where we are lacking. We want it without developing for it. There is no wise father who will put a load on the child that the child has not grown to carry. Now, there are several definitions of who a leader is. But if you allow me, I will just do a chain of one definition. And it goes this way. A leader is one who keeps developing. Now, leadership is not static. Leadership is a process. It's not static. A leader is one who keeps developing capacity. Now, don't miss that word. Capacity development is a major task of a leader. Before I continue with the definition, even Jesus had to develop capacity. Look, where your development stops is where the limit of your assignment is. Allow me to say this. Don't pray for more. Prepare for more. I have found this from God. Because ever before you pray for him to use you, he has been looking for who to use. 
So it's not your prayer that will make him use you, but your preparation. Leadership is all about capacity development. Real leaders don't pray to become one. They just develop themselves to emerge as one. I want to repeat that. Real leaders don't pray to occupy position of leadership. They just simply keep developing themselves until they emerge. And they change in their levels as they keep preparing. So, he is one who keeps developing capacity to influence, to inspire, then to direct, to motivate, to mobilize, to activate others to pursue a common goal and purpose. So, this is a compound definition, which simply means a leader is an influence. A leader inspires. A leader directs people. He motivates people. He mobilizes people. He activates the ones who are sleeping to wake up to duty. He garners people together to pursue a purpose, to pursue a goal. You need to check yourself. Are these attributes in me? If people are not rallying around you, you need to find out what the matter is. Don't blame people for not being committed. Blame yourself for not being an inspiration. Blame yourself for not being an influence. You see, it's natural. In any society, you just find leaders emerge. They just emerge. In spiritual leadership, you don't select, you don't vote, you emerge. In a spiritual system, you don't beg for people to follow you. You don't campaign for people to follow you. No. You just influence them and they find themselves lining up behind you because they are found that in spiritual system, followers just simply found their leader. They found their leader. And they just discover that they cannot do without him. They start following and they can't stop following him. Jesus told his disciples, once you go from me, he said, whither shall we go from you? We have found who to follow. We are stick to you. We can't stop following you. That's who a, a true leader is. A leader is one who tells people, stop following me, and they say, no, we can't stop following you. It's not one who beg people and challenge you. Why are you not following me? <laughs> if you ask people to follow you, you have a problem. Let them willingly, readily follow you by reason of what they find in you. Say loud, amen. amen. Let me hear louder, amen. amen. Now, what do we mean by leadership, aptitude, and attitude? The word aptitude is taken from apt, which means to be smart. To be resourceful. To be intelligent. To be clever, not in the sense of crookedness, but in the sense of doing his work with excellence, with skill, with expertise. So if you want to be a builder of yourself in leadership, in a sound and lasting way, you have to combine both aptitude and attitude. Again, aptitude is a process of 
acquiring skills and expertise towards developing capacity for specific assignments. But attitude is about developing the required character that gives value to the aptitude. It is character that gives value to capacity. It is attitude that gives value to aptitude. Aptitude is about what you know. Attitude is about how you live within what you know. People may admire you for your aptitude, but they will follow you for your attitude. People may give you ovation for your IQ, but they will follow you for your character. There is intelligent content and there is character content that every leader must possess. Aptitude is possessed through your studies. I mean, just anybody can develop himself mentally. But attitude is assessed through the experiences you go through, the experiences, how that you used to be proud and God takes you to an experience to make you malleable, to destroy certain things that ought not to be that may tamper with your aptitude. Today you have a lot of ministers and leaders who are very eloquent, highly so, full of skills and expertise, but lack followership. I have discovered, and please take note of this, most growing churches are built by people with character. People with right attitude who may not be as strong in skills and expertise. This is very important. Attitude is core. Aptitude is a plus. It's only a plus. Now, now we will see from scriptures that you see, God's appointment is not based on skills and expertise, even though he may give consideration to that. But the core thing God is looking for is your attitude. Your attitude. Attitude is foundation upon which aptitude can function. Those of us who know about triangle in mathematics, no triangle can grow up without a wider space, I mean base. If you want the triangle to increase in height, you have to extend the base. Attitude is the base upon which aptitude is built to go up. And we want to see how to combine the two together to keep developing yourself. So you develop in aptitude and develop in attitude to match. Aptitude can end as a waste without attitude in place. Attitude is the promoter of aptitude. People hear you for what you know, but they follow you for how you live. That's why this must be well combined. Now,
How do you develop your leadership aptitude? I present to us perhaps things that we are familiar with, but with some emphasis. How do I develop my leadership aptitude? Because this is important. And these are things we found to be in Jesus, our ultimate leader. Now, Jesus developed both in the spirit great attitudes and he also developed aptitude. Jesus was not a dullard. He was highly intelligent. His intelligence was admired by Sahendrims, by high level class of people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to a point that they said, hey, which school did he go to? Where did he get this kind of wisdom from? We never found his name in any school of learning, but we cannot argue what he's saying. Often they will come to him and the way he will answer them with great aptitude, they return from him with shame. He was smart. He was apt. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going to. Nobody could confuse him. And we need such in our leadership today. Say loud amen. amen. A louder amen. amen. In John chapter 5, verse 15. Chapter 7, rather, verse 15. 7, 15. They said, where did he learn this thing from? Knowing that he knew no letters. They didn't, go, they didn't know the school he went through. They were amazed at his high-level intelligence. Now, Number one aptitude every leader must develop is clarity of vision. Clarity of vision. Vision is the straight in stock of any leader. As a matter of fact, what the eye is to the body is what the leader is to a people. Let me repeat that again. What the eye is to the body is what a leader is to a people. Now, your eye guides your choice. Your eyes guides your feet. Your eye tells you where to go and where not to go. In the same way, the leader limits the people and the growth of the church. And what makes him the leader is that he can see what others around him cannot see. And that's what vision is. Vision is the ability to see what others cannot see. That makes others to rally around him. So he must continue to have clarity of vision. Clarity of vision. We are familiar with Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1, all the way to 3. Write the vision. You can't say you are a leader without a clear vision. Clarity of vision. Say loud, amen. amen. He must have a picture, and a big one for that matter. He must possess the ability to see ahead. Except you know where you are going, you cannot get people to follow you. People follow a man who knows the way, not one who is guessing. You don't enter a vehicle and start driving and the passengers ask you, where are we going to? You say, I don't know, I'm just going to. <laughs> they will ask you, Oga, please stop one minute, I want to ease myself. One after the other, you see them disappear. In this wise, a leader must be able to, listen to this, receive a clear vision, understand the vision by himself, and of course, very importantly, be able to communicate the vision to the people around him. Because people will go along with you to the extent to which they understand the vision you must be able to receive and understand and analyze and communicate the vision to the people in clear terms. 
in this wise, a leader must be a strong communicator. I know what you see convinces you and makes your language strong. It is lack of vision that makes a leader's language weak. When the vision is clear, you will be speaking to a point that everybody is convinced. Now, if you watch Jesus very well, if you watch Jesus very well, everybody he spoke to believed. Except for those who just chose not to line up with him. He will meet someone with a withered hand and say, stretch forth your hand. It's the way he spoke that compelled the individual to stretch forth his hand. Except for his oppositions, everyone who came to him with a genuine heart to follow, just followed everything he said. He spoke with such conviction because he knew where he was heading for. Vision is the strength of conviction. Vision is the strength of conviction. And believe me, if you don't get to a point of strong conviction, you cannot be a leader. He was so convinced that even if the 12 left him, he would start another church. That's why visionaries don't beg. Visionaries don't beg for followership. Visionaries believe that himself and his vision and God is more than enough. If you abandon a vision before you return, you will see him as move forward. If you abandon a visionary, before you return, you discover that he has left you where you met him. And every leader needs this. I want to repeat again. Vision is the strength of your conviction. Vision is the strength of your conviction. Once you get it clear, you can drop it. No matter who is with you or who is not with you. Say loud, Amen. Number two, aptitude every leader must keep developing is acquisition of knowledge. Acquisition of knowledge. Buy the truth and sell it not. Knowledge is free by availability, but not free by acquisition. There is a price to pay. The price of purchasing the price of spending time to read and to study, to search and to research. <laughs> Jesus called learning business. Luke 2.49 Don't you know I must be about my father's business and what was the business? They found him seated among lawyers and doctors, both hearing and asking questions. They found knowledge pacified, I mean personified, seeking more knowledge. How well you sit to learn will determine how great you rise to lead. As his custom was, the same Luke chapter 16 to 19, he went into the temple as his custom was to read. And they delivered him to, to him the book to read. Accustomed learners always end as acclaimed leaders. Accustomed learners. Show me a learner today, I can point to him as a leader tomorrow. There are no two ways about it. One who gives himself to learning today is simply preparing to lead tomorrow. That will be your story from henceforth. Amen. Say loud, amen. amen. As we have heard the saying, leaders are learners and learners are potential leaders. Leaders are learners and learners are potential leaders. Think about Moses. Moses was a man of letters. Acts chapter 7, verse 28. He gave himself to the study of the things in Egypt. Think about Daniel. Daniel went 
through a school, Daniel chapter 1 verse 3, the king was looking for people who would be able to represent and be able to stand before the king. Now see, we need to prepare ourselves for the high place that God has prepared for us. The way many of us ministers, you know, conduct ourselves does not show we want to go to the high place. We have reduced ourselves to local ministry output that we cannot go up. And what takes people up is what they put on their head. What enters here is what takes you upstairs. God knew that a time is coming when Moses will need to stand before, the, 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 before, before Pharaoh. God will assign you only to what you are prepared for. He will assign you to only what you are prepared for. There are churches today, you see the pastor uh, is local, pastoring local people because he's not developing himself. So people who come to hear him, they can't understand what he's saying. And so they can't sit with him. Each of us must develop ourselves in knowledge. We saw how Daniel rose. Chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. And then verse 17 to 20, he was in the class with others where they discovered that he was 10 times better than others. Jesus did not only come with anointing, he came with wisdom. His wisdom was super. As they valued his anointing, they valued his wisdom as well. So let's get back to learning and learning and learning and learning, acquiring skills, developing our expertise over and over again. Now, there is a book that most of us ignore to read, and that is the book of Job. I recommend each of us to try to study the book of Job. Forget about the experience of the man, the author of the book. Now, the book of Job is loaded with wisdom. Here's something that was being said in chapter 12, verse 3 of Job. Very, very inciting. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not therefore inferior to you. This is what knowledge does. It destroys inferiority. Every inferiority in the man is rooted in ignorance. If you are ignorant, you'll be cheaply intimidated. And many of us suffer that today. I have understanding as well as you through knowledge, and I'm not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these things you are talking about? Chapter 13, verse 2. What you know, the same do I know also. Therefore, I'm not inferior unto you. I'm not inferior because I know what you know. Now, Jesus took time to study the books. And so each time they came to him, he would say, is it not written in the book of Hoseas? Is it not written in the book of Moses? He knew what he was going to use against them. We need to get equipped by increasing our knowledge. Job said, I will fetch my knowledge from afar. Job 36 verse 3. I will fetch my knowledge. Local knowledge will reduce you to local impact. Global knowledge will enhance your global ministry. Say loud amen. amen. So knowledge overcomes low esteem, inferiority complex, intimidation, and enhances your confidence. Number three aptitude every leader must develop is to become ambitious. Every leader must learn to be ambitious. Now, this may sound contrary, but it is not. You must be ambitious. What is ambition? Ambition is a desire to achieve. It's a desire to achieve. Ambition is not 
an enemy to vision. No. Vision is knowing what God has told you. Ambition is, look, I want to get it. Ambition is a vehicle on which vision rides. There are many people with great vision, but they don't have the drive. They don't have the zeal. Ambition means here to be goal and result oriented. You break your vision into goals and you are pursuing it. You set goals, you plan big. You set goals and you plan big. Plan so big as if if you don't get it, you will not rest. It takes passion to create passage. It takes drive to create motion. And it creates zeal to remove seals. It takes zeal to remove seals. We're talking about sealing. Many people have sealing over their head. But when you find a zealous man, he breaks the seal to another level. That's why you find out that people who are ambitious in line with their vision, nothing can stop them. Say loud, amen. amen. You find them talking big. They are not just being proud. No, there is something that is moving them. The zeal is there. The passion is there. The drive is there. If you are not driving, you cannot move to any level. Say loud, amen. amen. Now, I tell people I don't know much, but I drive so much. I don't know so much, but I drive so much. You cannot impress God with the knowledge you have because he gave you the knowledge. But you can let him know how ready you are with your zeal. Jesus was very zealous to a point that people recognized this and said, the zeal of the house of the Lord has consumed them. Say loud, amen. amen. There are many ministers who are sluggish, sleepy, to a point that things slips off their hands. They are so sluggish that they end as rubbish in ministry. He went from place to place with zeal in pursuit of the assignment. Number three, number four, you must develop courage. Courage. Look. No door will open to you with ease. You have to be courageous. It's one of the aptitudes that you have to develop. <laughs> uh, Moses told Joshua when he was living. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, verse 7, and verse 9. Joshua, be strong and be that courageous. Be strong. There are people and situations that want to intimidate you. Your pastor in rent is about aspiring. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Many are defeated before they meet challenges. Many, by mere thinking of what is ahead of them, simply give up. I love the saying in the West here that a man dies only once. So go and face the death that wants to kill you. Do you know, Jesus didn't wait for them to come to arrest him. No. As soon as he finished, he, Peter, let's go and meet them. He went to meet them. He went to meet those who wanted to kill him. And he asked them, who are you looking for? They didn't meet him as a coward. Cowardice is a great enemy of leadership. You cannot take the lead as a coward. You have to be rugged, you have to be blunt and blunt. You have to face the challenges when they are coming. The good land will not be here. The pastor was telling me, water log everywhere. You need courage. Let's go into the waters. Let's start fellowship here. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when you see any man at the top, don't just admire where he is. Find out the challenges he faced. Find out the... You see, we, whenever you are studying people, study them to the root, 
not to the fruit, to the root. Don't admire the fruit. The fruit is a consequence. Don't admire the fruit. Go for the root. If you get the fruit, you will not miss the root. I mean, if you get the root, you will not miss the fruit. Say it loud, amen. amen. I don't wish I have what my spiritual father, Bishop Oedipo, has. I've never wished so. But I find that what is this man doing? What are the challenges he faced? Let me be prepared for it. If I face the same challenge, I will get the same result. Say it loud, amen. amen. Now, as I speak to you right now, I cast out every spirit of cowardice. The ability to be bold, to be courageous, to face the lions. He said a coward will say, hey, there's a lion on the way. Now, one way cowardice expresses itself is by giving excuses. You see, you know, you know, you see, and you will always have that. Excuse will exclude you for what belongs to you. Beware of it. Excuses are not born with you. They are made by you. People make excuses where others are triumphing. The, what didn't allow you, the excuse that didn't allow you to move forward is the same path other person followed to take what you should have taken. I release upon you the spirit of courage. Boldness. You have to be daring. You have to be steadfast. You have to be resilient. You have to be resilient. You must be dogged, heady. You have to be heady. You have to be tough. You have to be firm. You have to be decisive and resolute and never to give up. Once you know this is where God is leading to you, man, open your chest to it. Open your chest to it. Throw out your head like the tortoise. Don't seek for a cover. Anybody covering you will not let you move forward. Many of us know tortoise. The tortoise will hide his head and the moment the head goes inside, it cannot move. The only way, the most important thing in the tortoise life is the head. But the head has to take the risk. Otherwise, there will be no move. Somebody has said, it is risky not to take a risk. Now, those of you who have been around the farm before, you, understand, you study plants. You will discover that there is no tree that grows under another tree. Stop looking for where to hide. Stop looking for who will help you with finance to run your ministry. I was privileged to start pastoring the church of four people. I was sent to go and plant that church with a companion with 5,000 naira only in 1987. House rent is there. Furniture is inside the money. With a strong warning, if the money is lost, just get lost with it. <laughs> Don't return home. <laughs> Amen. First hand bill we did was 20, 20 copies of hand bill. That's what the money could afford. 20 pieces. Or go to the street corner, go everywhere, and give each hand bill. You read. I'll wait for you to read it. When you finish reading it, I take it and give it to the next person. And give it to the next person. How? Boldly, courageously, moving forward. If you ever fall, fall forward. Not backward. At least you will have gained some space. It's all right to fall, but make sure you fall forward, not backward. Fall if you want to fall. Cry if you want to cry. When you finish crying, let your eyes be clear. Amen. <laughs> if you think you should complain, complain. But after your complain, speak to yourself. Be courageous. Say, I receive it. Say again, I receive it. Now, please listen to this. There are people who teach what they don't know. There are others who teach what they have experienced. If you listen to somebody teaching what he does not experience, it's only informing you. But if you listen to somebody teaching you what he has experienced, he's imparting you. So I see you living here with the spirit of courage. If you left a challenge before you came in here, you go back and meet it. 
and tell that challenge, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. As a matter of fact, before you return, the challenge will know that, look, this is a different person coming and clear up the way for you. Amen. So Moses told Joshua, why did he tell him so? Please get seated. Joshua was a young man. I, I, I suppose he was intimidated. He had never been in leadership hierarchy. He was intimidated, afraid. Elders were there. And the Lord told him, hey, I mean, Moses told him, be strong and be of good courage. These people will confront you, but don't look at their faces. God told Jeremiah the same thing. He said, don't look at their faces, lest you be cowed before them. Don't look at challenges. Look at the one who sent you. Look at the sender. Otherwise, the opposition will send you back. Look at your backing. Otherwise, they will push you back. Be courageous. Do you know that the grace of God does not work for weaklings? 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. He said, thou therefore my son, be strong in the grace of God. So grace works for strong-hearted people. Be strong in the grace of God. Say loud, amen. amen. Let me quickly go. I leave you with these four. Aptitude you need to develop. Don't forget, number one, clarity of vision. Always make your vision clear. Write and rewrite, and rewrite, and rewrite. There is something about writing. You see, writing invites the brain. The more you write, the more inspiration you gain. The more you write, the clearer the thing becomes to you. Your writing queries you. Are you sure of what you are writing? I don't know about you, but that occurs to me several times. And your writing brings you into a point of conviction. Because in all probability, putting pen on paper is like putting fire in your soul. Somehow you get committed to what you are writing. So write. True leaders are writers. True leaders are writers. I use average of a note every month. I have minimum 12 notes that I write in a year. Not 20 pages, not 30 pages, not 80 pages. I write. I write. Any light that comes to you, write it down. Any inspiration, write it down. You will need it tomorrow. Sometimes when I read my old note as far as 20 years ago, I'm amazed. Am I the one who wrote this? Write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite your vision. In order to make it clear, the more you write, the clearer it becomes and the stronger your conviction becomes. Say loud, amen. Yeah. I hope somebody is getting something here. Go for monolith. Be ambitious. Make big plans. Make big plans. While you are pastoring a church of 30 people, plan for 3,000 people. There is no crime in planning. You lose nothing planning, but you lose everything not planning. Plan. And set time on your plans. If you don't hit it, by the time you say it, you are getting closer to it. Say loud amen. amen. Don't wait for things to happen. Be ambitious to get things happen and then develop your courage. Now, what are the leadership attitudes that we need to develop? I'll quickly run through that. Let me first say that men are demanding for your aptitude. They want to know what you know. But God is looking or seeking for your attitude. Men will appoint you on the basis of your aptitude, but God will place you on the basis of your attitude. Men want to know what you can do. They want to know of your competence and capacity. But God wants to know who you are and what your tendencies are. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows you may be proud if he places you over a church of 5,000. So he will limit you to a church of 350. You pray and pray until you're almost dead. He said, I've checked your attitude. If I allow you to reach 1,000, nobody can reach you again. Amen. <laughs> you know, God weighs us on the balance and knows our tomorrow. 
There are pastors, if they ever see 1,000 church, they will hire security men to be following them. Anywhere they go to. Because nobody will be able to reach him again. So, well, let's leave him where he is. When he develops right attitude, then we can raise him up. He has the aptitude, but he does not have the attitude to match. Your attitude. Now, this is what gave room to Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus talked about what we must be. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after God. Blessed are the pure. These are attitudes. The things you must be, not the things you must know. The things you must be. God is after who you are before what you can do. God has no problem empowering you to do things the moment you can maintain who you are before him. If God blesses you with a church of 5,000, will you remain humble? Will you not pursue after fame and reputation? There are people today, if you don't call them by their title, they just, they just get angry and sit down like frog. Why are they not recognize me here? Are you called to ministry to be recognized or to be famous? The attitudes. And number one here is your spirituality. You must develop high level spirituality. Because assignment in ministry is a spiritual calling. It's a spiritual calling. Church is spiritual entity and therefore demands spiritual approach to leadership, not secularity. Church to many people today have been reduced to secularity, to motivation, and all of those stuff. Spirituality must be maintained. The first thing about Jesus is that he grew strong in the spirit. Luke 2.40, he grew strong in the spirit. What are the elements required for spirituality? The word. Be scriptural. Scripturality. Be in prayer and fasting. These are things that have no substitute. It's foundation. The foundation of the Lord stands sure and has this seal on it. Let those that call upon the name of the Lord live in purity. Let them be spiritual. Let them be spiritual. And we must drive everybody around us to be spiritual. Because once we lose our spiritual content, our intelligent content is of no use. Be spiritual. Say a loud amen. amen. A louder amen, please. Amen. A spiritual amen. amen. He said he worked strong in the spirit and became full of wisdom. So wisdom, which we call the intelligent Quotent or aptitude builds on our spirituality. Number two, humility. Humility. Moses the humble became Moses the great. The greatest pastor that have ever been, a pastor of three million people, was set to be humble. Numbers chapter 12 verse 3. Exodus chapter 11, verse 3. He was humble. There is a place, a special place in God's heart for the humble. Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the heaven be far from the heart, yet the Lord hath respect to the lowly. With God, the lower you go, the higher he takes you. Permit me to repeat that. The lower you go, the higher God takes you. Therefore, you humble yourself. God does not humble people. No, you do the humility. What God does is to humiliate those who do, do, who do not humble themselves. Humility means 
not counting yourself as special among others. Not counting yourself as special, but only privileged. Several times I see people sit across my table for counseling, and I say to myself, why am I not the one on the other side being counseled? It could be you. So it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the heart. The heart is the heritage of the meek. You don't know how much you can obtain as an inheritance until you begin to live a life of humility. Say loud amen. amen. Let me hear a louder amen. amen. Jesus, our greatest example, Philippians chapter 2, he humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation. One thing people are in pursuit of today is reputation, 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 recognition as against relevance. See, the truth is, if you live relevant, you will end with reputation. Sometimes we turn the game the other way around. Nobody ever gets reputation. What you should do is make yourself relevant. Make yourself relevant and you will not miss a reputation. Don't look for popularity. Jesus did not. Several times he will perform a miracle and go into hiding. He will tell others, don't tell them I'm the one who did it. Every leader as we grow must consciously make himself level-headed. He must make himself level head. Let me repeat that again. You have to deliberately make yourself level-headed. When people begin to share testimonies, making reference to you, tell God inside you, Lord, please forgive them. They don't know what they are saying. They intended to mention you, not me. Because if somebody share one testimony, it enters somewhere in your brain. Yes, I think now they recognize me in this church. You start to lose it. Don't seek reputation. Don't seek comparison. Don't seek to be where others are. Live contented. These are all elements that brings about humility. Say loud amen. amen. Now, receive that grace right now. Amen. Receive that grace right now. Amen. Sustainable leadership is impossible without humility. It's impossible without humility. Number three that looks like it is servanthood. Servanthood. We saw in the same Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 9, the attributes of Jesus. He was a servant. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 25 to 27, I am among you as one that serveth. Only those who stoop to serve will rise to lead. It is in your stooping to serve that you find your place to lead. If you cannot bend, you will never rise. The extent of your bending to serve will determine the extent of your rising to lead. Now, in the same ministry where I am today, serving under God's servant Bishop Oedipo, once upon a time, I didn't have opportunity to lead prayer in meetings. Once upon a time, I was a technical officer recording his messages. That was the highest I could go to. Once upon a time, I was serving as an usher. I was stooping to serve. Not even having a dream to lead. I've told you earlier, real leaders don't even desire to lead. Leadership is not what you desire. No. Please let me repeat this. Don't desire to become a leader. Be content to be a servant. Because servanthood is platform for leadership. Look at the story of David. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. 
The people literally begged David to lead them. And you know what they said? They said, once upon a time, Saul was the king, but you are the one that led, 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 led us. Saul, king. David, leader. He led them out of captivity. He led them out of their trouble. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, can you see? King. Many people are behaving as kings today. That was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said, thou shalt feed my people Israel and thou shalt be a captain over us. You see, you have to bow to lead. David literally surrendered his life for him to be sacrificed for the people. So among others, leadership element is sacrifice, selflessness, forgetting about yourself, preferring others to be honored than yourself, preferring others that their names should be mentioned above your name. That was the position that David occupied. And at the end of the day, they begged them to come and lead. Say loud, amen. There is always a future for those who serve selflessly. And again, I decree, receive grace for it. Receive grace for it. And finally, among others, leadership attitude number four is appreciation. Be thankful. Be grateful for wherever you are part time. <laughs> Be thankful. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I was privileged to pastor a church of four people to start with. And then we increased to seven. And then we increased to 12. We increased to 15. Then we increased to 18. Then we increased to 13. We never reduced once. We are always on the increase. But ever thankful, ever thankful, we were in a three-bedroom house. The sitting room was the church. I have my bedroom. And what do I have there? I have a bench with mattress on top. And the guest room, the same. For guests who care to come to live with me. And the office, the third room. I told people, some members of the church, who are working in the construction site to make a table for me. He asked, what about the money? I said, don't you have off-cut wood in your site? So they made the table with off-cut wood. By the time they put the table on the floor, one leg was this way, the other <laughs> I had to shock it with bottleneck. I was so excited one day, I stood before the table with all the books I have. Come on, photographer, snap me now. With excitement with excitement, be full of appreciation. Be full. Now, I can't be talking about furniture. If I want, I can be changing furniture every year from my personal money, not even from the church money. Appreciation. I had one coat. My wedding made it possible for me to have the second coat. One pair of shoes. I had no money to buy new shoes for you know, marriage. After a while, the shoe opened in front. I mended it, it opened again. I vulcanized it, it opened again. The shoe wanted to be praising God. Sense of appreciation. If you don't see the fruit according to Habakkuk, keep celebrating until the harvest comes. Appreciation. This is something you must not miss. Don't let your head be cast down. No! Now, the podium I had then was one wooden podium because the thing is imbalanced. I had to be holding it like the people would think that that's where the anointing is. <laughs> they didn't know I was protecting the head from falling down, or the top from falling down. One day I got so excited. On Saturday, I looked for red oxide to paint the floor. And on Sunday, when people came to church, I said, man, aren't you grateful to God? God is giving us a red carpeted church today. <laughs> Full of excitement full of joy and rejoicing every day. Keep looking forward. The future is waiting for you. Rise to your feet, please. I can see you clapping for the Lord, believing that you got something here this morning. Raise your voice and give thanks to God with me right now. Thank him from the depth of your heart. 
Thank him from the depth of your heart. Thank him from the depth of your heart. Thank him from the depth of your heart. Lord Jesus, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' wonderful name, we are prayed. Now, permit me to say with all sense of humility and responsibility, I want you to stretch your hand here. What I have, I want to release upon you. Now, God has given me grace in the subject matters I've talked to you about, especially in servanthood. In joyfulness and appreciation. In humility. And I want the same to be part upon you because I see these things are very fundamental. If you don't get this one, no matter how much you try to make it, you can't rise. Stretch forth your hand. Whatever you think you should pray for, as I stand before you right now, call for it right now. Call for it right now. Not just here to teach, but here for you to receive a touch. Raise your voice now and tell God as you decide to receive it. I stand before the Lord as one who has received this grace and I release the same upon you. 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 Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. In the name of Jesus, continuous strive for spirituality. Receive it right now. Continuous humility that guarantees your upliftment. Receive it right now. Continuous crave to see to the well-being of others in serving them. Receive it right now. Continuous sense of appreciation. Thanking God and thanking people who have been a part of helping you to move forward. Receive it right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone who believes, say loud, Amen. Please give God a big hand as I hand over the microphone back to our pastor.